Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Rachel Campos Duffy is a parenting expert, author, blogger, political pundit, and television personality uh, who got her television start on that granddaddy <laughs> of all reality TV shows, MTV's The Real World. Um, her television credits are beyond that very large and diverse. Uh, she's currently a recurring guest on NBC's Today Show where she does parenting and relationship segments. Also on Fox News' daytime talk show, Outnumbered. Uh, for the past 14 years, she's been a recurring guest host on ABC's The View, appearing more than 25 times. She's been a guest on Dr. Phil, on Fox and Friends, The Hannity Show, The Mike Huckabee Show, Politically Incorrect, Huffington Post Live, EWTN's The World Over Live, and CNN, where she is a frequent on-camera commentator on parenting, politics, and culture. Rachel writes for the Today Show blog, todaymoms.com. She also writes for National Review Online, The Huffington Post, American Spectator, CatholicVote.org, and NBCLatino.com, among others. Uh, she's the national spokesperson for the Libre Initiative, an organization that educates and advocates for the economic empowerment of Hispanics through limited government, entrepreneurship, and self-reliance. Her book, published in 2009 by Penguin, is called Stay Home, Stay Happy, 10 Secrets to Loving At-Home Motherhood. In 2008, uh, Rachel co-hosted the series Speaking of Women's Health on the Lifetime Network with the legendary Florence Henderson. Rachel has a degree in economics uh, from Arizona State University and a master's degree in international affairs from the University of California, San Diego. Um, she lives in Wisconsin. Um, she and her husband have seven kids. Um, when you add all of that up, you figure she probably has a stay-at-home husband, uh, but she doesn't. Uh, Congressman Duffy, her husband, um, also has an active job as well, as you can imagine. Um, the the uh, s Many of you know my wife and I have six kids, and I once appeared on EWTN. <laughs> <laughs> so from that, I'm just projecting <laughs> and wondering, when do you sleep? <laughs> Um, please join me in giving a w very warm COA welcome to Rachel Campos Duffy. I'm going to start off, but first of all, thank you so much. Thank you for this invitation. It's an absolute honor to be here. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, I feel very old. I, I, as soon as I'm around college kids, so, so thanks. <laughs> um, I'm going to play a video to give you a little more background. Those are all true things that he said about me. However, um, I, I think it, it gives you a more full picture um, if you hear a little bit about my family's American dream story. Um, so let me play that for you here. Okay. Now I feel really old because this is not, no, okay, here we go. Yeah. The mouse keeps moving on me. <laughs> okay, there we go. For me as a parent, it's important for my, my kids to still appreciate how lucky we are to live in this country and the kind of sacrifices that their great-grandfather and their grandfather made so that they could have a better life. My name is Rachel Campos Duffy. As a mother of six, nothing is more important to me than my family. My grandparents came from Mexico, and my father was born in a small copper mining town in Arizona. They were very poor, but they were very resourceful. And so, even as a young kid, he was a shoeshine boy. He started his own piñata business when he was only 12 years old. Um, so he's somebody who figured out at a very young age that what he couldn't do in Mexico, he could do in America, which was to transcend his poverty through hard work. When I was growing up, my dad was often in night school, earning his degree. And I think what he passed on to us he didn't really tell us, he showed us. You know, Hispanics were not a monolithic group, but I think what we share, uh, the most important thing we share, is a work ethic, is a drive, is a willingness to sacrifice for the next generation. 
The reason why America is distinct from the rest of the world is because you can do whatever you want to do as long as you set your mind and establish your goals, you can do it. This country gave my family the freedom and the opportunity to succeed. But I'm worried that government programs that are supposed to help Hispanic families are actually doing harm. I think kids are growing up in a time when this sense of entitlement and dependency on government is starting to take over. I know how hard my dad worked. I don't want my kids to lose that work ethic. And that's why I joined Libre, because it's an organization that mirrors the values I'm teaching my kids. Libre's mission is to be a voice for freedom, a voice for economic liberty, a voice for self-reliance, and the belief in America that if you work hard, you can make a better life for your family. We do this person to person, heart to heart, in the communities we want to serve, offering programs that empower people. We're on the ground, fighting for the freedom and opportunity that make the American dream possible. Join us at joinlibre.org. Thank you. So I am the national spokesperson for the Libre Initiative, but my most important title, oh my goodness, hold on, um, is mom. Aaron. How do I turn this off? Right. See, it's not just me. <laughs> um, my most important title is mother uh, to seven children and wife to my husband, who happens, as uh, you mentioned, to be uh, a US representative for Wisconsin's seventh district. Uh, a lot of people wonder what it's like to raise seven kids um, in this very hyper-political family, my husband is a politician, I am a conservative activist, and so whenever people ask me that question, I tell them the story that is true. Um, not too long ago, um, I, we, live in a, we lived in a house where the downstairs um, part of the house was what we called the kids' room or the rec room, and that's where the kids had all their toys and all the things, and so one day I came down into the rec room and the place was an absolute wreck. It looked like a tornado had gone through there. There were toys strewn everywhere, and of course I said, everybody is going to pick this up, and I left, and they were all down there, and I came back, and it didn't look like, when I came back, it didn't look like anything had changed, and so I was very upset about this, and I said to the kids, you know, what's going on? I, I, was, I left you here, it's been almost 20 minutes and nothing's changed down here. And the two oldest ones kind of looked at each other and one of them piped up and he was about, uh, I don't know, 11 at the time and he said, well mom, um, look, all of this other stuff, the younger kids did that. And me and Evita, my, the oldest one, we picked up our part but the rest of it is theirs. And I said, what any good mom would say. I said, I don't care who made this mess. Um, nobody is leaving this rec room until it's done. And as I said that, he sort of crossed in front of me to pick up a toy and he mumbled something under his breath. And I said, Jack, were you mumbling something? And he said, no. And I said, I, I heard you mumble something and I'd like to know what you said. And he said, it was nothing. I said, Jack, I want to hear what you said as you walked across to pick up that toy. And he said, fine, I called you a socialist. <laughs> and that is what it's like um, to raise children in this hyper-political environment. Now, you saw a little bit about my family's story in this video introduction, but I want to share with you a little bit more about who I am, where I come from, and um, in particular as it relates to my dad's story. As you saw, my father's parents came to America from Mexico, and my dad was born in a very small copper mining town called Sonora <laughs> in the mountains of Arizona. He was the 11th of 15 children. Now, my dad's family um, was poorer than most, and in Sonora, 
that's really saying something. Uh, the Campos siblings had one green bike to share among the 15 children. My dad actually occasionally recounts a very painful childhood memory of his. He was in kindergarten and a fellow classmate sort of cruelly pulled his pants down, revealing the depths of his poverty. They were too poor to afford underwear. Um, but out of that poverty and even the occasional humiliation came a work ethic, came a resourcefulness that continues to propel not just him, but his children to even greater heights. Now, in addition to being a shoeshine boy, um, he would, uh, they, they would go to the bar right outside the mine after work. And if it was a Friday night especially, they could get somebody to pay him a, a quarter or a dime or whatever it was to shine shoes before their date that night. Um, but also, my, my dad and his brothers were little young entrepreneurs. They would go into the mountains of Arizona, and they would get what we call tuna, which are cactus leaves, and they would cut the cactus, cactus, cactus leaves, they would peel them, they would dice them, and, um, and then they would sell them door to door. Later, he became an apprentice um, to a piñata maker in his town, and then he figured out he could do it himself, and uh, on, a, on a stove, he got his mom to make with flour and water, the glue, and he started his own little piñata business. He was only 12 years old. Now, at the age of 18, he joined uh, the U.S. Air Force, and he married my mom um, on his first overseas assignment, which was in Spain, and my mother um, is from Madrid. Um, but even as a soldier in the Air Force, my dad was not afraid to take, or he didn't think he was too good to take on extra work. Um, after working at the base all day, my dad would go to this Chinese restaurant where he would wash dishes um, at night, anything. He would do anything that he needed to do to get his little family ahead. And somehow, by the grace of God, and um, by a good woman, my mom, he figured out um, with my mom that by using that work ethic and that resourcefulness towards an education, he could propel his little family into the middle class that he so wanted for them. And so as you heard on the video at night, uh, my dad was often at night school earning his degree. And he taught us by example that education and opportunity um, were the way to achieve the American dream. So in spite of his poverty and those occasional brushes with bigots and yes, with ignorance, my dad never ever saw himself as a victim. He maintained his dignity and he always maintained his optimism. And today, that shoeshine boy is retired, you know, that shoeshine boy that couldn't even afford underwear um, when he was a child is now comfortably retired and in sunny Arizona. It sounds pretty good right now, right? Um, if you were walking outside. And all four of his children have postgraduate degrees. Um, and his 15 grandchildren live lives that he really couldn't even imagine when he was growing up. My family, like so many of your families, have achieved the American dream. You are the embodiment, so many of you, of that American dream. And I can tell you that I am eternally grateful to this country and so thankful to God that I got to be born here. When conservatives ask me, how do you reach the Hispanic community? We hear that a lot in politics. It's something that my own husband's colleagues are asking themselves all the time. I tell them that it's not rocket science. Um, you gotta show up, you gotta talk about the American dream, and you gotta talk about econ uh, education and economic upward mobility, because that's what they want. Look, I don't know if many of you know this, but Hispanics actually start businesses at three times the rate of the average American. They are highly entrepreneurial. It's cultural for us. Have any of you here ever been to Tijuana? Anybody here been to Tijuana? If you cross over onto the Mexican side into Tijuana, the first thing that you will notice is that your car will be swarmed by people trying to sell you stuff. 
They want to sell you gum. They want to wash your window. They want to sell you balloons, piñatas, food, everything and anything that a tourista could want or doesn't yet know that they want, they will be selling it to you. Um, all of those people, all of them are small business owners and they have to be. They know that they cannot count on their government to provide them opportunity. So they have to create their own opportunity. I would posit to you that those Mexicans, those Guatemalans, those Colombians, those Ecuadorians who do make it to the country, to, to the United States of America are the most entrepreneurial. They are the biggest risk takers in their countries and they come here. They are natural capitalists. Plain and simple, Hispanics care about small businesses, Hispanics care about taxes, Hispanics care about regulations, and they care about economic liberty even if they don't know what it means. Education. Hispanics know that education is the great equalizer. It is our path up the economic ladder. The freedom to choose the school that is best for your child, I believe, is a fundamental right. Competition in education works. It is simply human nature. I ask you to ask any parent, if you ask their kid, uh, any parent ask, ask their kid, run from here to the mailbox. Will they run faster if they run by themselves or if they, you say run to the mailbox with your sister? Um, they'll run faster if their sister is competing with them. I can tell you personally that there is nothing that gets my Latina blood boiling faster than liberal elites like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama who shut down school voucher programs for poor minority students while they send their own daughters to elite private institutions where annual tuition costs more than most Hispanic families make in an entire year. It is quite simply an outrage. And as a conservative mom, as a conservative activist, I tell my fellow Hispanics about this blatant hypocrisy every chance that I get. Conservatives and yes, Catholics of every political persuasion should be in every urban center fighting shoulder to shoulder with desperate parents against entrenched unions, special interests, and government's unfair monopoly on education. Finally, show up. That's what Libre is doing all over the country. We have literally embedded ourselves in Hispanic communities. We are hiring from within those communities. To be honest, we, we took this model from a very successful progressive model of community organization, something our president knows a lot about. And so we've actually taken what they're doing successfully. We embed in communities. We don't leave when you know politicians and campaigns end. Um, we hire from within the communities, but we are offering services that empower, not enslave. Our counterparts, my opinion, my counterparts, our counterparts on the left, I believe, um, they want to help with more government programs that lead to dependency, to cycles of poverty, to broken families, and to diminished dreams. Libre offers English language courses, um, assistance with starting a small business. Uh, we also help them with tax preparation. Um, and we offer many other self-empowering services. I have seen firsthand in Hispanic communities that there is not a rejection of the principles of free market, of limited government, of individual liberty, of parental school choice and education and personal responsibility. There is an absence of these ideas in those communities. When they hear these ideas, what they say to us is, why hasn't anyone told us this before? I want to show you right now a video that kind of captures that sentiment. Um, this is the story of, and I'm going to need some help up here <laughs> with, the, with the video. I don't want to screw it up here. This is the video right here. This is the story of our executive director. He is the person who actually uh, founded um, the Libra Initiative. And, um, and his is a true story, and um, it's an American story. 
and I want to share it with you. Per capita in the nation. We used to have these Espanola jokes. My name is Daniel And really Garza. the brunt of the joke was the people. My American My people. experience started off. And I realized that I could help some of these people. Here in Espanola. For me as a parent, it's My name is Daniel Garza, and my American experience started off here. I grew up picking crops with my family. My parents were immigrants from Mexico with nothing but a fourth grade education. We were so poor. My siblings and I would often miss school to work in the fields. Our home was the size of a tool shed. We had no running water. And what we would do is warm buckets of water on the stove so that when my parents returned from work in the fields, uh, they would bathe uh, with small cups. My father never took welfare because he didn't want to depend on anyone or lose his dignity. He is a proud and noble man. He can make it with just three things. He's got good credit and freedom, liberty to work. And that's what the United States is. You know, I didn't know it at the time, but my father began saving money and buying and selling small properties. He bought a motel with the profit he made. My family and I spent long hours fixing up that motel while still working the fields. My father continued to buy and sell property, and one day he and my mother retired with enough money to live comfortably for the rest of their lives. If I don't come to the United States, I don't think I have the life that we got right now, living so good, you know. My parents' American dream had become a reality. My family and I have succeeded by following the path to freedom, but that path is on the verge of vanishing. What we're starting to see here in America now is a growth in the size and the scope of government that is now starting to look like the governments that we left behind. I'm just torn apart when I see folks who are caught in this um, dependency that government offers. And not only that, they've condemned their children to a life of mediocrity and subsistence. That this is not the American dream. This is an American nightmare. The Libre Initiative is reaching the Hispanic community before they are lost forever. We know advancing economic freedom is the best way to improve human well-being, especially those at the bottom. And that's our message to the world. You know, one day I was speaking before a group of 150 evangelical Hispanic ministers in South Texas, and a man stood up. He had tears in his eyes and said, you know, I've never heard these things before. Why has nobody told us? Most Hispanics have never even heard about economic freedom, but they know it. Cuba, Venezuela, Mexico, Hispanics leave countries that have been ruined by tyranny to come to America, the land of the free. They don't just believe in the cause, they've lived it. It is a privilege to live in the United States because this is a nation where you dictate your destiny. No other nation has fulfilled more dreams and more aspirations than this country. And to have been born here, uh, I'm just grateful to God for that. Learn how you can get involved at joinlibre.org. I would posit that outside of this business school, there's a lot of young people that also don't know the ideas about economic liberty, the, uh, the ideas that Daniel was talking about in that evangelical conference. They feel it, they, they, they kind of know it, but they don't, they never heard it said in that way before. And I believe that our ideas are not just popular with Hispanics and immigrants, seeking upward mobility. I think our ideas are attracted with young people like you. Now, you might not believe that if you look at popular culture, where conservatives have a very serious deficit in terms of their presence, something I, I think um, needs to change. It's actually give a, a talk about that as well. Um, we can talk about that some other day. But I want you to look at this video that I'm going to show you right now. And I want you to tell me 
that these celebrities that you see on this, vi on this video that I'm about to show you are not closet economic conservatives. It's hard to believe, but when you see this video, you will see that almost all of them were surrogates for Obama. And yet, their message is leave it as message. It's a conservative view of how to achieve success and upward mobility and the American dream. How do you lift yourself out of poverty in a way that respects your creativity and your human dignity? Can we turn the lights down? And we're going to play this video here. Um, let's see. That was the one that was at the bottom here. Think about the last five years. Enter our protagonist. Enter the most powerful force for change on the continent. Enter the strongest, loudest, clearest voice for progress. Enter commerce. Entrepreneurial capitalism takes more people out of poverty than aid, of course, we know that. I believe that opportunity looks a lot like hard work. When I was 13, I had my first job with my dad carrying shingles up to the roof. And then I got a job washing dishes at a restaurant. And then I got a job in a grocery store deli. And then I got a job in a factory sweeping Cheerio dust off the ground. And I've never had a job in my life that I was better than. And every job I had was a stepping stone to my next job. And I never quit my job until I had my next job. And so opportunities look a lot like work. To all my little homeboys and homegirls back in the city, I came up in that same county building. Food stamps, welfare, section eight. Check it out. You looking at me on TV right now, this is living proof that you can do anything you put your mind to, you feel me? Real talk. They call us the minority, you know, the black and brown, blacks, Latinos, but for sure, for sure, if you keep love, God, respect, and hard work in your heart, you can do anything you want in life, all right? I mean, it's all about hard work, I think. For me, that's what it was about. I went and I took dance classes and I offered my help to work at the desk so I could take all the free dance classes that I wanted. Because that's what I wanted to do. I think that eventually, hard work, dedication, and a willingness to learn everything without any ego is what is really the recipe for success. And you have to really know who you are. You really have to remember where you started, who you are, and nobody can change that. We, um, we show that video a lot when we go speak to young uh, high school students, sometimes junior high, Hispanic junior high girls and boys. And I'll tell you, that video is very powerful to them um, for a lot of reasons. I, I personally love the story about J-Lo. I mean, I just think, you know, I can't afford dance classes. It's not an excuse. She volunteered to work the desk. That's the American way. That's the American dream. Um, and they are all very effective <laughs> um, spokespeople for um, economic liberty. All of them are. One of the things that my husband and I think that we bring to the pro-liberty movement, if you will, um, is, and I think this is thanks to our start, both of us had our start on reality TV. He mentioned that, uh, <laughs> that I was on, on, on The Real World. Well, so was my husband. He was on The Real World Boston. Um, and I think it's that experience of having been part of something um, so cheesy, if you will, um, is an understanding that conservatives really can't afford to snub pop culture. Um, we can't afford to be afraid of it. We can't afford to sit back and cede it to the other side. Um, if we want to win elections, but more importantly, if we want to win over hearts and minds for economic liberty, we have got to win the culture. And we need to enter that proverbial lion's den 
if we have any hope of changing that culture. Today, thanks to technology, social media, YouTube, and yes, reality TV, conservatives have an ability to be culture makers, um, to have our voice heard, but we have got to engage. We have to have the courage and the conviction of our ideas, whether it's the hypocrisy of school choice uh, or those who are against it, the cynicism of the war on women or the dismal and pathetic economic results, I believe, of President Barack Obama's agenda for minorities. <laughs> we need to be on the offense. Paul Ryan once said that in 2012, we were arguing about big government in theory. I'm gonna close this so that doesn't happen again. In 2012, we were arguing about big government in theory. Today, we see it in practice. And I think that the midterm elections um, this month, or last month, prove that Americans don't like it. The president's polls are plummeting. I can tell you from, with Hispanics, um, it's dropped by, there's no demographic that has dropped support for the president more than Hispanics. It's dropped by 25%. I think there's a real opportunity for conservatives, for those who care about economic liberty, to sell our ideas, to explain it. But it is a perpetual process. As Ronald Reagan once said, freedom is special and rare. It's fragile. It needs protection. He reminded us that those ideas are not passed down in our bloodstream. They must be fought for in every single generation. Sean and I have a very big family, seven kids. He lives here three to four days a week. I'm out in Wisconsin. I fly out when I can to come do things like this. Um, it's not easy. And I'll tell you, it's not easy on our kids many times either. Um, but we do it because we truly care. We care about freedom. We care about a, about a system of government that offers opportunity and upward mobility. We care not just because we are Americans, but we also care because we are Catholics. And this day, um, <clears throat> these days, we hear a lot about um, Pope Francis. We hear a lot of praise for Pope Francis from folks that we wouldn't normally think we'd hear praise for him from. Um, the Gay Advocate has been praising Pope Francis, Planned Parenthood. Um, I think all of the hosts of MSNBC have had kind words to say um, to Pope Francis. Now, I think that their approval stems from uh, what they perceive to be a softening on the church's um, position on certain hot-button social issues. But I believe that Pope Francis has been equally misunderstood on economic issues. I think that uh, socialists of all stripes have embraced him as their own. Um, but they have also ignored subtle and not so subtle statements he has made about the dignity of work and about upward mobility. Something that, um, and he also has talked, frankly, about um, how upward mobility and opportunity helps people rise out of poverty. And that is something that free economies, free markets, have the distinction of delivering more broadly um, and better than any other system of government. The church and the pope speak often of the Christian obligation of charity and kindness towards those who are less fortunate. There's no disputing that the nations that are the, have, or the nations that have the most economic liberty and who champion um, freedom um, and the corresponding responsibilities of freedom um, for the individual. Places like the United States have produced the most charitable people that our world has ever seen. Um, Jesus didn't ask the Roman government to feed the multitudes. Through his miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes, he taught us that the church and its people, who are the body of Christ, are individually responsible for the hungry, 
and the needy among us. Now, during um, his visit to Brazil, the Pope's visit to Brazil two summers ago, um, he spoke of the crisis of chronic youth unemployment that is the hallmark of so many European nations that embrace socialist ideals, countries like Spain. I don't know if you know, but it might be of interest to you because you are all so young. Um, today in Spain, youth unemployment is a staggering 57%. It's almost 58%. It's the highest across the European Union. The Pope expressed concern for a generation who, as a result of lack of opportunity may never learn how to work. I can tell you that I've personally seen this in my family. I have cousins living in Spain and mostly in Madrid who, because of this chronic unemployment, never learned to work in their teens or their 20s. And today they are 30 and 40 years old. They don't know how to work. They're unemployable. More importantly, the psychological effect that it has had on them um, I think they suffer from a lack of initiative that's been bred by the years of dependency they've had on the government and, frankly, on my aunts, um, their mothers. Emotionally and psychologically, they lack the confidence and the self-esteem that working and prospering young people would normally have. The economic stagnation and the dependency of European-style socialism is a cautionary tale for anyone who thinks that government programs can be a substitute for the benefits of work and earn success. And this brings me back to Pope Francis and his comments in Brazil. <clears throat> he told reporters on his flight home to Rome, people get their dignity from work, from earning their own bread. And I could not agree more. At a very important time, when people across the globe are debating the proper role of government, and the best solutions for solving a worldwide economic downturn, Pope Francis pointed to a very simple and powerful truth about the human spirit. Work and earned success are crucial to our human dignity. <clears throat> and I need to add that individual prosperity also enables us to experience the joy that comes from sharing our blessings with the poor. I think Mother Teresa said it best when she cautioned against the temptation to turn to doctrines of class struggle. Instead, she said, what we need is, quote, a class encounter in which the rich save the poor and the poor save the rich. Let me say that one more time because oftentimes in academic circles, there is a lot of temptation to turn to these doctrines of social um, of social struggle, class struggle. Class, what we need, she says, is a class encounter in which the rich save the poor and the poor save the rich. And with that, I want to introduce you to my husband. He is um, my partner in crime. He is a third term congressman from Wisconsin, born and raised there. He sits on the Foreign Relations Committee and on the Financial Services Committee. He was recently appointed to be the chairman of the Subcommittee for Oversight on Financial Services. He is a recovering lawyer. Um, he is also a former world champion lumberjack athlete. I don't know if you've ever um, been up late, hopefully not drinking, um, and turned on ESPN at around 3 in the morning you might see um, those lumberjack sport competitions, and Sean was one of them. He was a, a world champion speed climber on those giant 90-foot trees where they climb up and they come down. Um, he um, is a dad. He's an awesome husband. He's a great partner. Um, and I'm going to bring him up here with me, and both of us will take any questions if there are any. Thank you. How's everybody doing? <laughs> it's amazing how many people show up when it's mandatory. That's awesome. I was like, why is everybody coming in, Rachel? You're a big draw. And, like, uh, <laughs> and they also get, you have to swipe when you Right. <laughs> Government's working well. Don't worry about that. <laughs> any, any, questions? any questions? And you can ask about anything. I mean, even if it's real world, we'll answer it. 
our claim to fame is we're the first uh, reality TV couple in America. We have our meeting on tape. Um, yeah, that's yeah. true. The first moment we met was captured on video. Uh, Very exciting uh, stuff. Uh, on video. Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Aiden Burns. Uh, I think you brought up a pretty important point about how society now is kind of leaning towards a uh, attitude of entitlement. But something that uh, I thought about while watching the videos was I don't really think that hard work is characteristic of just one group of people. But I think you did bring up a good point that like people nowadays actually do need to work hard and work on their own. But even Kendrick Lamar said that he had uh, pro ha was provided food stamps to kind of help him get him going. And I think that welfare is something that needs to be discussed, but it's more of a political issue. And I was wondering, we're all, all, everyone here is in the School of Business and Economics, and I think our school is actually moving towards a new way of educating business and saying that we can do good while we're in our profession rather than waiting till we've made money and giving back. We can do it now. So I was just wondering what you uh, could tell us about what we could do like while we're pursuing like these careers in business. How could we help people pursue economic freedom while operating in a vocation of business? I think you bring up some really good points. I do think that this is a country of immigrants. I mean, we're having this national debate right now about immigration. And we can, there's a political discussion about what's the right way to do it or not do it or how we do it. But I would say that what immigrants have always brought to this, so it's, I'm not saying that, I will say as a Hispanic, I think we work hard. Um, and I'm not gonna apologize for that. But I will say that first generation immigrants of any, any of them have always brought a certain energy, a certain um, work ethic, a certain drive, a certain grit that has always benefited um, this country. And it's always provided an, an example and a reminder for all of us of why this country is great and, and the opportunities that it provides. Um, I agree with you that you don't have to wait until you, you know, become the next Bill Gates to, to help people. Um, but I, I think it's interesting what Ashton Kutcher did. I mean, I think he educated a lot of people about what it takes to get there. I think there's a lot of young kids these days um, who are watching TV and see someone like that and just think it just happens. And it doesn't just happen. And I think when you ask what you can do as a student in, who's privileged enough to be in an institution like this, in a department like this that is ex actually giving these ideas something that so many business departments are not doing is to share it, to share those ideas, um, to talk about them, and to engage in debates in your school and in, in your families and in, in your circle. Um, I, I just think that we have to constantly, it's like that Ronald Reagan quote I gave you, we have to constantly and perpetually remind ourselves, this, is an, this country is an idea, it's not passed down through the bloodstream, it's a constant battle. Maybe I could uh, partially answer it as well. We, we have a debate um, in the media and in Congress and uh, probably in the classroom. What do we do with unemployment benefits? People are having a hard time. Should we extend unemployment benefits? What do we do with minimum wage? If you ask you know, people who are Democratic at a very high percentage, they'll say, obviously, raise the minimum wage. If you ask Tea Party Republicans, 60% of them will say, raise the minimum wage. Um, we talk about uh, food stamps and making sure we're helping people out. And I believe there's a role for government assistance. But you have to have the right balance. And I don't know if you guys talk about this in class. Our example in Wisconsin is uh, we have unemployment just over 6%. And we're having these conversations about minimum wage, about unemployment. But we have jobs in manufacturing, machinists, welders. You can drive truck. You can get a CDL, a commercial driver's license, in three weeks in Wisconsin. You can get behind a big rig and uh, you can make 40 to 60 grand a year. They can't fill those jobs. There's no one coming, they have trucks, they have loads, but they don't have drivers. They can't get people in. And so the question becomes, are we offering too much? Do we not have the right balance? Um, are, are, are people not out there hunting because government is giving too much? Um, or is there some other reason for this? But when we have opportunity in our communities and we can't fill those opportunities with the workforce, we have to reflect on that and go, maybe we've got it wrong. Maybe there's a different way to do it. And the compassionate thing to do isn't always to give more. The compassionate thing is to have the right balance 
um, so people get help when they need it, but also incentivized to get off it and get back into the workforce. Do you guys talk about that at all? Is that discussed? Yeah? Real problem. If you have any advice for us, we'd love to take it. Great. <laughs> Well, oh, we got a question? Okay. Hi, my name is Paige, and you guys mentioned that you both met on TV, and you said you're open for any question. So can you just tell about how you met? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on, I think you guys know, everybody here knows what the real world is on MTV, right? Everybody knows? No, no, okay. So the real world is sort of like the granddaddy of all reality TV. It's sort of where it all started. And it started on MTV, and the experiment was, what if we took seven people from very diverse backgrounds and stuck them in a house, in a really, really nice house, <laughs> and taped them for like six months? What would happen? And um, so I was in the third, so it, it had been on for two seasons. It started in New York, and it was sort of like a real, like, you know, not very popular show, but people were starting to get curious. And then they did, they did it in L.A., and then they decided to do it in San Francisco. And I had just, was about to graduate um, with my degree in economics from Arizona State on a bet with a friend. I applied, um, 40,000 people applied <laughs> to be on the show, and they picked seven. And I got flown out to San Francisco to be in this. Sean got flown out um, to be in Boston, which was three seasons later, three seasons later. And then right after his show, um, they said, well, what would happen if we took one person from each cast from the last five seasons and sent them on a really wild, cool adventure through the United States and New Zealand, and we filmed it for a month. Did you guys, I know Road Rules has been done for a while. Have you guys ever seen Road Rules? So Real World did Road Rules. That's what this That's was. Right. One cast member from each Real World season uh, did the Road Rules tour for three weeks together. I was picked for my season, Rachel from hers. Yeah. And so we just got a one-way ticket to go. To, I got a one-way ticket to go to Vermont. I don't know where your ticket was to. I was waiting for her. She got off the train. She handed me her bag, and I think I've been carrying it ever since. <laughs> so... And so we did this little tour together, and I, I uh, was attracted to her. I uh, did my best to make her uh, have an interest in me. I feel so old. <laughs> and um, she didn't, really. And so I, had a, I was in law school at the time. I took, I took a year off of law school to go do reality TV. I don't know why, but I needed a, a break, <laughs> I guess. And uh, I had like two months before my next semester of law school started. So uh, after the show was over, I went to L.A. I'm a Wisconsin guy, small town. And went out there, and a lot of reality TV goes to L.A. A lot of them die there as well. <laughs> um, and she had no interest in me. And about two months after she I got, I went back to law school. A month later, she was uh, flying. She, we, we used to do these speaking tours where we go speak about the real world to college campuses. And as she was coming back from a show, she stopped in Minneapolis where I was back in law school. We, I picked her up at the airport. We went out for, for coffee and- Let me just be clear. So <laughs> <laughs> Here's why I stopped to see him in, <laughs> in Minneapolis. Because I knew, you know, the real world always does these reunion shows, right? And I knew he was upset because it didn't end up working out with us and I was not that into him. And so, <laughs> I was afraid we would go to one of these reunion shows, and I knew he was a really nice guy, and I wanted us to still be friends and it not be weird when we go to the reunion shows. So I said, I'm going to Minneapolis, Milwaukee, I'm gonna stop through Minneapolis, and let's just, you know, hang out. So we go to, <laughs> we go to, we go to uh, this little diner, have coffee for three hours, just friends, she has no interest in me, and at the end of the conversation, I swear to God, she says, I think I love you. I'm gonna marry you. To which I'm like, Whoa! <laughs> so I brought her back to the airport. <laughs> Anyways, we started dating, and, then we started dating and, then the and as good Catholics, we now have seven kids. So there you go. <laughs> and if I can offer you any advice, if you want to get involved in politics, do not do reality TV. 
I promise you, you'll embarrass yourself, you'll say stupid things, and it'll come back to haunt you forever, okay? <laughs> One more, one more question? Or no, we're done? Good. We're, we're, I'm sorry? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's a very good question. Um, first of all, when I... Um, met Sean, I was up for a show called The View and with Barbara Walters. And so I thought that that was what my life was going to be. Instead, I ended up marrying Sean. I ended up, not, I was the finalist. I, the job went to Lisa Ling. I got married. I had three kids. And guess what? The job came back around when Lisa Ling left to go do National Geographic. And Barbara Walters called me back and said, we'd like you to audition again. Um, and I did another series of on-air on live auditions. And it was between me and um, Elizabeth Hasselbeck. And Elizabeth Hasselbeck got the, got the gig. And so up until then, I thought I had kids, but I thought that I was you know, going to go do that. Um, and I was sort of between gigs. Well, after I didn't get the gig the second time, um, I was home. And I oddly, I was pregnant with my third, and I oddly did not really long to do that as much anymore. And I became an at-home mom for the next, um, what, uh, seven years? Seven years, something like that. Um, and then a couple years ago, um, and I wrote a book about it, and I think at-home motherhood is a wonderful thing. Um, it is, it is as, as powerful, um, as beautiful as any choice any woman could ever make. Um, a couple years ago, I got the opportunity to join the Libra Initiative as their spokesperson, and I work mostly from home where I'm with my children, but I do travel. I'm definitely a lot more active than I was in my earlier years. Um, but I, it's, it's, a, it's a constant battle. It's very hard. Um, working it all out um, is, is sometimes like, you know, watching sausage being made and how do I figure out where everybody's at? I've got four kids at four different schools. It's very crazy, it's very hectic. I would not do, I would not allow my husband to do what he does, and I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't really passionately believe that um, this helps people, that this message of economic liberty, of self-reliance, um, is something that really helps people. If I could add to the conversation of at-home motherhood. Um, I'm really, listen, you, lo you, look, you look at media, uh, Rachel's at home with the kids, but she's able to, you know, write. Um, Internet has done amazing things for people to be able to work from home. She'll do hits on CNN uh, via Skype from our living room. So there's a lot of things that she's able to do from the house and still be an at-home mom. And it's, so it's pretty cool. You can find a, a, a unique balance that you couldn't have 20 or 30 years ago. Today's technology and being an at-home mom, I think, provide unique opportunities. I always say it's not your mom's at-home motherhood experience. I do think technology has absolutely changed the experience. I have as much information as your average journalist would have because I have access through the Internet. And so I think some of the isolation and some of the, um, the, the lack of community, you can find that online. You can participate in ways that just were simply not possible 20, 30, 40 years ago. So um, I would tell you this. I will leave you with last advice for the women in the room um, the most important decision and actually it applies to the men the most important decision you will ever make in your life is who you marry and um, that will determine um, how you balance things if you have a real partner so thank you so so much can, can I can I leave you guys with one last hit the Capitol is right down the street uh, we can, I'm only taking conservatives, Republicans. If you guys are looking for uh, opportunity to come and in, uh, intern on the Hill, there is great opportunity, wh whether it's Republican office, if you're a Democrat, go to a Democrat office. You're right here. You can't beat the experience. Uh, and know that we're all looking for interns. Sometimes we don't fill all the positions. Looks good in a resume. Uh, we hired one of Catholic's own, Jackie Riley, who's uh, in my scheduling office. But um, please consider that. Good opportunity right down the street. Thank you all. <laughs>